Good morning and welcome to the International Conference on Fossil Fuel Supply and Climate Policy. We are very, very pleased to welcome you all here um, to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Elisa Arend, uh, and this is Mikel Munoz Cabré. Um, we are co-chairs together of this, this year's conference. Um, in this world that we've been living through the last couple of years of COVID, it is, we're very aware of what a, an immense privilege it is to be able to meet together in, in person. At the same time, we're aware climate policy is more urgent than ever, with the impacts of climate change increasingly visible and acknowledged. But geopolitics also continue to shape in new ways the dramatic and challenging landscape for phasing out fossil fuels placing new pressures in the opposite direction, and also new geographies have come to the fore. Equity issues are as pressing as ever, or more than ever, as the pandemic has exposed so many of the deep global and international inequalities, showing us the central importance of justice in planning for the energy transition, in mitigating its costs, as much as distributing its benefits. This is the third conference after the 2016 and 2018 conferences held here in Oxford, followed by a virtual gathering we had in 2020. Um, SEI, the Stockholm Environment Institute, uh, is an international organization that bridges science and policy um, with the aim of fostering more sustainable development pathways. We conduct research, inform policy, support and help build civil society capacity, all with a foundation in scientific research, we have offices in Stockholm, Bogota, Boston, Tallinn, Bangkok, Seattle, Davis, Nairobi, York, and here in Oxford. Uh, one of our flagship publications, which was actually inspired at an earlier version of this conference, um, was, is the Production Gap Report, uh, which we've published since 2019. I think we have a couple uh, hard copies here for anyone who wants to, to uh, take one with you. Um, this has been published together with key partners, many of whom are here at this conference. Um, we're very pleased to announce there will be a PGR 2023. More information from colleagues um, can be shared. So you will meet a number of our other SEI colleagues from our different offices who are either chairing or presenting at different sessions um, throughout these two days on topics from just transitions from oil, gas, and coal, to health impacts of fossil fuel extraction, to diversification of national oil and gas companies, among others. Um, if any of my SEI colleagues that are in the room could raise your hand, we we'll just get a sense. We've got a few uh, continents covered, I think, here. And so thank you all for joining. I'll pass the word now on to my colleague, Mikhail. Thank you, Elisa, and um, it's, hello, everyone. It's so great to see all of you. Uh, we are very grateful to our steering committee who have been vital in shaping this conference and in reviewing the many, 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 many abstracts received. So thank you for that. Uh, also to the Queen's College for hosting us again. It's a great place to be. And uh, we're our sponsors, KR Foundation, are you in the room? Not yet, they're coming later. So thank you, and to SIDA as well, the Swedish Development Agency. We're grateful to our partners that have done all this work with us on fossil fuels. And most important, we're grateful to all of you for coming here. And so thank you. And, um, and without further ado, let's have the fun begin. Michael, you have the floor. Ooh, fun. Um, I think that there was one acknowledgement left out there, and that was to Mikkel and Elisa, who have done an amazing job of bringing us together in this challenging moment. So I just want to say a huge thanks, um, because I don't have to do it anymore. Um, <laughs> And, and it's a shout out to my uh, old partner in crime in this, Hara Van Asselt, who would have loved to be with you. I spoke with him on Friday, he sends his regards. Um, and uh, when we launched this back in 2016, we had no idea of you know, what sort of impact uh, this community would have. And so, um, you know, it's much has changed since six years ago when we had this first 
fossil fuel supply and climate policy conference. Uh, the energy transition now has a sense of inevitability and momentum that really wasn't there in 2016. Um, the topics that you all work on and we talk about, stranded assets, carbon lock-in, just and equitable transitions, uh, they were niche topics, now they're mainstream. Um, and we have this vibrant community of researchers, this packed crowd. Uh, that we have here today of you know researchers activists investors and now even government officials calling for uh, a managed decline of fossil fuel production this is really rather remarkable and and owes a lot of thanks to the people in this room so really a lot of gratitude here for you and all you've done um you know look around you know the networks the alliances that have been created these tools uh you know, uh, trackers that launched just this last week and, and, and multiple others. Um, and shameless plug for the production gap report, again, that got its inspiration. And if you're, um, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, the next iteration of production gap report, seek out Ploy, Ashley Kulwisud in the audience, as myself as well. Um, but as you know, we're still dealing with a lot of the same challenges um, that we were then and in many cases in new forms. You know, how to ensure that a transition can really truly be workable and just and equitable. How can we hear and, uh, from and support and amplify the voices of indigenous communities and those uh, local communities that, that feel the greatest effects of fossil fuel production? And then how to ensure that this current energy crisis that we're in doesn't undermine the prospects for this transition, and rather we seize the opportunity to accelerate it. So with that, it's a great honor and privilege for me to uh, introduce uh, three uh, leading lights on those three questions that tee up a number of themes for the conferences to come. So first up, Christoph Mugalay. So Christoph, head on up there. Um, and if there's one thing that hasn't changed since 2016, it's, it's Christoph doing, uh, uh, being central to seminal analysis that has really changed thoughts and ideas back, back then in 2016. He and Paul Eakins, who is here, um, had, had recently published their Nature paper on the geographical distribution of unburnable carbon that really popularized the notion uh, that many others had already put out there, but on an academic basis, that a majority of fossil fuels needed to stay in the ground, and kind of which ones uh, were the least likely to be developed. And then now, Christoph is head of the uh, energy supply unit at the International Energy Agency, where he leads the analysis behind the World Energy Outlook, and was lead author of that net zero by 2050 report that came out in 2021 that had that important finding that under a 1.5 degree world, no new gas or oil fields would be required or no new coal mines. And it's certainly something that we've seen uh, had a profound effect. So it's with great pleasure that I turn it over to Christoph. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a it's a real um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And actually, as Michael mentioned, six years ago um, when I was here, it was Michael himself who asked a very pertinent question during during that conference. And that question was, what level of fossil fuel prices are best if we want to accelerate energy transitions? And this is a question which we at the IEA have been thinking about for for all of the years since then. And of course, it's extremely relevant today because given the global energy crisis, we are seeing very high fossil fuel prices and this has risks and perils for the energy transition. We need to acknowledge today that we are in the first ever global energy crisis. It's different from what happened in the, in the 1970s, which mainly affected oil. And this is going to have impacts for many years to come. But if we want to understand the risks and the perils that there are for the energy transition, we first of all need to understand what caused the crisis that we see today. 
because the tightness that we see in fossil fuel markets predates Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Earlier on in, in 2021, we had the rapid economic recovery from the pandemic. We had the impact of a number of different weather events, whether that was low hydro generation in Brazil, whether it was low wind generation in Europe. There's been planned and unplanned outages to supply, both low emission supply and natural gas generation. And also very importantly, we haven't been investing enough into energy. We haven't been investing enough into clean energy forms, and we haven't been investing enough into fossil fuel if we don't have that investment into clean energy. And I'll come back onto that very shortly. But of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine sharply ex exacerbated the tightness that we see in markets. And some people have tried to portray the crisis that we see today as a result of climate policies. We need to be very, very clear. This is incorrect. The more rapid deployment of clean energy, of efficiency measures, would have helped to protect consumers and avoid some of the upward pressure that we see in fossil fuel prices. Whenever people misleadingly blame the crisis on climate policies and on clean energy, they're distracting from the real culprit, which is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A more sustainable recovery from the pandemic and a faster ramp up in clean energy would also have helped to avoid the increase that we're seeing in CO2 emissions. 2020 saw the largest ever decrease in CO2 emissions in a single year, but in 2021, we've seen the largest ever increase in emissions in a single year. And in fact, that increase in 2021 was larger than the drop in 2020. And so emissions are at the highest ever level, and it's likely that emissions will continue to rise this year. Clearly, this isn't good news. And actually, that increase that we saw in 2021 continues the trajectory there has been for the past 20 years whenever global CO2 emissions have been rising substantially. And we shouldn't lose sight of where we are heading and where we need to head when talking about climate change. Before the Paris Agreement, our outlook for emissions was very clear. We saw a continued rise in fossil fuel use and in CO2 emissions. And this is what would have led to a catastrophic level of warming around about three and a half degrees by the end of the century. But now there's a very different picture for emissions. In our state of policy scenario, which just takes on board those policies that governments have put in place, as a result of those policies, as a result of the technology changes over the years since the Paris Agreement, we see a very different picture for emissions. Emissions would peak in the next few years and then very slowly decline. And when we look out in terms of the temperature rise, this would lead to around about two and a half degrees by the end of the century. So just in the past seven years, we've shaved around about one degree off that long-term temperature increase. However, of course, 2.5 2 degrees is still far too high, and it would still lead to massive climate damages around the world. But there are also the net zero pledges that governments have been announcing. And this really does change the picture for emissions. If we take on board all of those net zero pledges that governments have announced, whether that's Europe in 2050, United States in 2050, China in 2060, and so on and so forth, if you add all of those together, it, in our estimates, this would lead to a temperature rise of around about 1.8 degrees by the end of the century. And this is very significant because it's the first time that governments have put in place or announced policies of sufficient ambition that we could limit the temperature rise to below two degrees. But there's two very important bits of context here. First of all, it can't be taken for granted that governments will bring about the policies that are needed to underpin those net zero pledges. And in fact, as we see here, those pledges haven't yet been backed up by the policies that are needed to, to bring them about. And secondly, even if all of those pledges do get realized, it doesn't put us on track for 1.5 degrees. We're still a long way off 1.5 degrees, and 
a number of things need to happen if we want to realize that, um, that first of all, it's going to require governments to significantly increase their ambition and significantly increase their, um, their explicit climate policies. And we also can't let that long-term date. If we want to limit temperature rise to one and a half degrees, roughly speaking, we need to be at net zero emissions by 2050. But we can't let a, a time in 28 years from now distract from the changes that are needed today and are needed over this decade. Unfortunately, many of the technologies that are needed to bring about a near-term peak and reduction in emissions, to get on track for 1.5 degrees are available and many of them are cost effective. Just to give some examples, wind and solar PV have grown incredibly rapidly over the past decade. Annual capacity installations quadrupled between 2010 and 2020, and they need to quadruple again if we want to be on track for net zero. We need around about 1,000 gigawatts of wind and solar to be installed around the world in 2030. And we have been making good progress on this. Our latest estimates are that in the year 2022, so whenever we get to the end of this year, we'll have installed around about 340 gigawatts of wind and solar. We also need to see a huge increase in electric car sales. Indeed, by the year 2035, nowhere in the world is there an internal combustion engine car sold. And by 2030, 60% of the cars that are sold would be, need to be electric. And again, there has been good progress on this front. 2022, we estimate around about 15% of the cars sold. One in eight cars sold will be electric. But also boosting energy efficiency is key. And here, unfortunately, progress has not been so good in recent years. Over the decade um, in the 2010s, we improved the, the energy, um, the emissions intensity, the energy intensity of the global economy by around about 2% every year. That needs to go up to around about a 4% improvement every single year. But unfortunately, since the pandemic, we've actually been getting worse. So the increases in 2021, for example, was only around about 1%. And there's a whole host of different milestones that are needed. I could go through all of these in, in a lot of detail, if, if time would allow, on what needs to happen by when, if we are to be on track for net zero emissions. But one of the important headlines that was, was mentioned by Michael and which, which generated a lot of attention at the time we released our report was on what does net zero mean for fossil fuels? Because we indicated that if we see a boost in clean energy investment, if we start to achieve many of these milestones on the power sector, on electric cars, on efficiency, on the industry sector, if we achieve all of those things, the declines in fossil fuel production would be sufficiently rapid that it's, we are, it's able, we're, pos, we're, we're able to meet those declines without investment in the new sources of fossil fuels. We wouldn't require any new oil and gas fields. We wouldn't require any new coal mines or coal mine extensions. And then, of course, we wouldn't require any exploration for new fossil fuels. But it's helpful here to provide a few additional words of context as to what this, this statement on no investment into new fossil fuels means. Because one of the things that got lost in that discussion is that there is still some investment into fossil fuels. We don't have investment dropping to zero in the next couple of years, because if we cut off all investment into fossil fuels, the declines in supply would be faster than the declines that we see in fossil fuel demand. And secondly, whenever we published the net zero roadmap back in May last year, we assumed that there would be a sustainable recovery from the pandemic. The governments would put in place lots of measures to help boost jobs, to help boost the economy, and do that in a way that would boost clean energy deployment. We also assumed that they would bring about very, very ambitious climate policies from the beginning of 2022. This policy surge clearly hasn't happened. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine adds an additional dimension to this picture. There's a good possibility that Russia's invasion will lead to a prolonged reduction and potentially a substantial reduction in fossil fuel production coming from Russia. And any immediate shortfalls that we see in production from Russia 
will need to be realized or compensated elsewhere, even in a world that's moving towards net zero emissions by 2050. The most suitable options to do this are those with short payback periods, which don't have long lead times. And this includes things like tight oil and shale gas in the, the United States, extending production from existing sources of uh, from existing fields and clamping down on flaring and venting and making use of that natural gas. But just to be very clear here, nobody should imagine that Russia's invasion of Ukraine can justify a new large scale and long uh, um, large scale and long lived investment into new fossil fuel infrastructure in the world that wants to limit the temperature rise to 1.5. And the reason for this is, is because of the long lead times that there are for many conventional projects. There's a lot of different stages that conventional oil and gas projects go through, from the issuing of an exploration license to potential discovery of that deposit, to the development of that, and then to first production. And when we look at what's happened for projects that have been developed over the past few years, we see that from the beginning of that process, from the issuing of a license to first production, it's taken around about 20 years on average. Some projects are of course a bit faster than that, some are much slower, but what this means is that any new projects that are approved for development are unlikely to make an immediate meaningful contribution to the fossil fuel balance anytime soon. And any resources that haven't yet been discovered or those that don't have any existing above ground infrastructure are unlikely to make any sort of contribution to alleviating the current energy crisis. The key thing for, to help alleviate the impacts of the, the energy crisis is to see a huge boost in clean energy, to see a huge boost in energy efficiency. But this is where there are some caveats on the finding on fossil fuel investments. Because we need to recognize that the primary thing that needs to happen if we are to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees is that huge boost in clean energy investment. When we look at the numbers here, there has been some increases in clean energy investment um, in the, the years since the Paris Agreement. But taking numbers for 2022, we have just over around a trillion dollars that was invested into clean energy. We need that number to quadruple. We need there to be um, over $4 trillion of investment into clean energy technologies by 2030 to be on track for 1.5. Less fossil fuel investment is required, of course, but the differences that we see in fossil fuel investment are not nearly as large as the, the big gap that we see there in clean energy investment. And indeed, reducing fossil fuel investment in advance of or instead of that scale up in clean energy wouldn't lead to the same outcomes as the net zero scenario. It wouldn't lead necessarily to 1.5 degrees. One of the things that we would very likely see is a huge increase in fossil fuel prices. But we also need to recognize if actions aren't taken on clean energy investment, then there's going to be an, an increasing gap between supply and demand. Whenever we do future updates of the net zero scenario, we might see a gap that emerges between declines in supply and rising demand for fossil fuels. And it's gonna be increasingly difficult to bridge that gap without any investment into new fossil fuels. But as I say, the key thing that we need to see is that huge boost in clean energy. But another challenge that exists here is that the gap in clean energy investment is most apparent in emerging and developing economies. And this points to new dividing lines that, that are emerging in energy and climate, with developing economies potentially being left behind. I mentioned there's been a slight increase in global investment into clean energy in recent years, but this has mainly been concentrated in advanced economies and in China. In other emerging and developing economies, investment levels remain stuck around about 2015 levels, even though there have been some bright spots such as solar investment in India. And this isn't just about emission reductions. In our net zero scenario, not only do we achieve net zero by 2050, we also achieve universal energy access by 2030. 
in line with the UN goals. And unless we see an increase in investment in clean energy, in emerging and developing economies, we also will fail to meet those goals on energy access. But I want to come back to that question that I posed at the start. And what do fossil fuel prices, what fossil fuel prices can help or hinder the, uh, the process of change? The current crisis provides us with a number of indications as to what high fossil fuel prices might mean for the energy transition. First of all, on economics. Price increases in fossil fuels clearly improves the economic attractiveness of cleaner alternatives, including things like efficiency. In some ways, this is a bit similar to introducing a CO2 price. If we look at the increases in natural gas prices in Europe since the beginning of this year, that's equivalent to adding a $300 per tonne CO2 price. But there are, of course, a number of differences between an increase in fossil fuel prices and increases in CO2 prices, because fuel prices don't reflect the carbon content of the different fuels. And we have seen that they've been incentivizing shifts away from natural gas to coal, for example. A number of countries have delayed the planned closure of coal-fired power plants. And we are seeing renewed investment into coal production in China and in India. On the political economy of transitions, countries can see high prices as a spur towards accelerating transitions. We've seen ambitious announcements from the EU with regards to the Repower EU strategy in the United States with the Inflation Reduction Act. And these are great measures to help boost that level of clean energy investment. I mentioned also at the start the 1970s oil crises, and we can also draw some lessons from there because this led to a huge boost in innovation, particularly in energy efficiency. But high fossil fuel prices also create the risk that affordability and security jumps to the top of the agenda of policymakers. And it can, and it can divert or distract attention from the need to reduce emissions. In addition, importing countries, if they are paying higher fossil fuel prices, won't necessarily be able to spend quite so much on clean energy. If they're sending that money abroad, they won't necessarily have the same amount to invest domestically on clean energy. It squeezes the funds that are available to them. And finally, high fossil fuel prices hit the poorest hardest and risk draining support for the process of change. They also lead to price interventions. We have again seen a number of countries introducing new fossil fuel subsidies as a result of the, the increase in prices. Those fossil fuel subsidies are rarely designed well in practice, and they often don't target those who most need the help. And this underscores the need for climate policies to help poorer households, including with the higher upfront costs that exist for many clean energy technologies today. Without that support, there's a risk that climate policies will become socially divisive, particularly in a time of high fossil fuel prices. If the rich households can protect themselves from the impacts of high fossil fuel prices and can shift on to alternatives, but poor households can't, there is a risk of some divergence and division. And when we put all of this together, in our view, high fossil fuel prices shouldn't be seen as desirable from an emissions reduction perspective. There are pros, there are cons, but on balance, we, we view it as negative towards the process of change. And in particular, high fossil fuel prices shouldn't be seen as a substitute for strong and robust climate policies. So just a few concluding thoughts on what I've been discussing. If we want to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, we need to see a huge boost in clean energy investment. If that happens, then as we set out in our net zero scenario, we will have declines in fossil fuel demand that can be met without investment into new sources of fossil fuels. Any new investments that are made risk locking in fossil fuel use, 
and passing on an even larger environmental challenge to future generations. But we need to take some care when talking about scaling down investment into fossil fuel supply. We're not on track for that boost in clean energy investment. And cutting back on supply in advance or instead of scaling up investment in demand risks driving up prices and making the transition more expensive, more volatile and less equitable. Nevertheless, today's crisis does remind us of the unsustainability of the current system and the urgency that there is for us to change. The world doesn't need to choose between tackling the energy crisis and the climate crisis. There are measures, there are policies that can be put in place to tackle both simultaneously. And that's what we need to see happening. We need to make sure that this is a historic turning point towards a cleaner, more affordable and more secure energy world. Thank you very much. Um, we're going we're gonna to hold off on questions till the end of the speakers here. So thanks so much, Christoph, for really sort of threading the needle on this careful uh, pathway to, to, to net zero and 1.5 uh, and all the considerations we need to keep in mind for that. So now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Jesse Burton who has uh, participated in all the conferences to date. She's a, a leading light in the discussions around just transition. She's a senior researcher at, at the Energy Systems Research Group at the University of Cape Town. She's also a senior associate at E3G. Um, she's on the steering committee for this conference, so thank you for that. Um, you know, she's a recognized uh, voice on an advisor on coal transitions in particular in South Africa as well as around the world. And so she's going to give us some insights today on how we can navigate this question of just transitions with at, at sort of a finer scale from the perspective of the global south. So thanks so much for joining us, Jesse. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Christoph. It's wonderful to be here in person. This is my first in-person event since 2019. It's very, very, I'm very, very excited. Um, and I'm really interested and amazed. There's been many years we've all been apart and it's exciting that we're going to come back together now and I'm going to hear from experts in the field and people who are working on this in all sorts of countries about the challenges that they're facing around fossil fuels and climate change. And um, it's going to be a really, really interesting first few days. Um, Many of you will be familiar with the South African context, so I don't want to talk too much about the detail of it, but I'll explain briefly some of the dynamics in the country and then, and then go on to some of the emerging lessons that we're seeing around, especially just transition in, in a developing country, a coal intensive developing country. Um, like almost all countries in the world, South Africa is highly fossil fuel dependent, but especially very coal dependent. So. Coal accounts for 87% of our electricity, 20% of our liquid fuels, um, which is converted from coal. Um, and it's a key input into industry, into exports and households who use it for cooking and heating still, 100,000 households in, in the country. From the mining all the way to end uses, coal accounts for 200,000 jobs. And almost all of those are very heavily concentrated in one province in Pumalanga, where there are 90,000 workers in mines and power plants alone. Um, I know when I go to India, people talk about 15 million people who depend on coal mining. It seems very small, but um, in a country where you have 50% unemployment almost, this, you know, talking about closure and accelerating closure is incredibly politically and socially sensitive. Um, and in Pumalanga, um, unemployment is, is above 50%, and for young women, it's, a, it's almost 70%. And that's the context in which um, you know, changing energy systems or energy being built in new places has, has enormous political salience. So over the last 10 years in South Africa, since labor and civil society in particular fought to get just transition into South Africa's climate policy, um, but especially in the last five years or so, the concept has really become incredibly prominent. The president appointed two years ago something called the Presidential Climate Change Commission, the PCC, um, and that they've really brought just transition into the public debate around energy transition. It has huge political salience now. 
Um, the PCC, which advises government on climate action, including just transition, um, comprises representatives from civil society, from business, from government, from labor, and also from the youth. Um, and they, they provide inputs and they've developed over the last few years um, the National Just Transition Framework. So that was approved by cabinet about a month ago. Um, and this provides a really interesting framework for, for the country to now start to think about how do you actually operationalize a just transition. So as this energy transition unfolds, how do you address energy access and these, and these other associated issues? Um, and our JTF has three principles Im embedded within it. Procedural justice, so the processes must be fair. Distributive, so the costs and benefits must be equally distributed or fairly distributed, not equally. And restorative justice, which recognizes that, that we're not starting from a place of justice. Um, that there needs to be a redress and remediation and rehabilitation for communities who are already impacted um, by fossil fuels and who will be further impacted by, 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 by climate policy. Um, in that, in the JTF, there, there, there are then kind of three policy areas which government has identified as areas of action for them. And the, they'll, these will be implemented across value chains. So coal is obviously hugely important, but also agriculture, tourism, uh, automotives, other sectors that are going to be impacted by climate policy. Um, and, and these will be implemented kind of in response to identified vulnerabilities. So those are social protection measures, um, and this could be temporary income support, it can be uh, grants, it can be retraining allowances, there's sort of various various elements of that. Um, industrial development, innovation and economic diversification. So a, a lot of effort goes into industrial policy, into new sectors, into diversifying both uh, regional economies, but also the national economy. So switching to electric vehicles, for example, electric vehicle manufacturing. And, and finally, skills development and human resource development, which recognizes that, of course, workers are going to be hugely impacted, but it's a bigger question around the education system and green jobs and skills for, for, for unemployed youth. Um, and the, the kind of goals of the JTF are, I think, incredibly ambitious. Um, it aims to achieve a quality of life for all South Africans in the context of increasing the ability to adapt to the adverse impacts of climate. Um, it looks at climate resilience. It, it, the goals include decent work, social inclusion and poverty eradication, but it puts people at the center of decision making, including the poor, women, people with disabilities and the youth. Um, it's about building resilience in the economy, affordable, decentralized and diversely owned renewable energy and conserving natural resources. So there's a huge amount of ambition. Um, and what we're seeing now is, you know, how do you start to operationalize this? What does it mean? How do you embed this in government policies? So we have this national framework. Um, our Department of Mineral Resources and Energy has also in parallel been working on their own just energy transition framework. Uh, regional governments are developing phase one strategies. It's kind of cascading and diffusing through government. Um, and our national estate and utility ESCOM is starting to repower and repurpose coal plants, um, including really interestingly developing a renewable energy training center at, at, one, at, at one of them that's about to close. But what have we learned so far? I think there's some emerging lessons which, which have, have salience more broadly. The most important thing is this is about development, not energy. In situations of poverty and inequality, the inescapable focus of governments and and other stakeholders is really development. It can't just be about decarbonization or energy transition defined nar narrowly. Um, and there's an ongoing tension between decarbonization only or decarbonization first, and what you need for these sort of place-based, context-specific interventions. How do you like respond to people's lived realities? Um, as we, if you go into coal regions, what, what people say is they're worried about water security, food security, going hungry, that services, they're worried about housing and education. Um, and renewable energy is important, but it's not always the response to some of these, these challenges. Um, so there are a lot of areas that are going to need work as part of a just transition, which are not just about energy. Some are. We need energy access, of course. We need public transport. Um, but there are other questions in South Africa that I think have, have relevance elsewhere. So informality, how, how are local economies, how, how does the informal economy connect to, to fossil fuels, who owns new assets, how are they financed, um, how are sustainable livelihoods supported for, for people. Um, in economic diversification, we have really interesting projects being proposed with really high levels of social ambition, but the finance sector doesn't know how to respond to them. Uh, so you need new models of finance, you need new financial systems um, to, to deliver social ambition. Um, of course, worker transition, skills and education, redeployment and retraining are important, but in contexts where you have 70% youth unemployment, that's not always the only area that needs focus.
Um, and another, and one thing that's being discussed, um, at least on by, by researchers in, in the country, is around social protection and thinking bigger. So, should we be thinking about universal basic income in, in the context of a transition, a transition grant for all impacted people? The second thing we're, we're starting to see is that governance and institutions are obviously very important, but it takes a really long time to embed and institutionalize the idea of just transition. So we have a vision and we have principles, but how do you translate that into government action at multiple levels? How do you, you know, diffuse it into budgets? Um, this is not trivial. Sometimes you need new institutions. We're developing a green economy cluster, for example, in Mpumalanga, which will drive economic diversification. But sometimes it's about getting institutions to incorporate or expand their mandates to think about how their role in the just transition will unfold. Um, and there's a need to expand many areas of action, as I've said. Um, we have to develop and support expertise in those areas are outlined. Um, we need sufficient support for technical analysis and data. There's, uh, you know, I go to, I go to workshops looking at different countries all the time where people are not even really sure how many people are going to be impacted. Um, that's not well understood. Um, there are these huge on ongoing gaps in knowledge. Um, and you need to build experts and expertise across sectors beyond energy. So industrial policy, uh, sustainable livelihoods. Um, and we need to think about how to draw in and link all of those existing experts and policy communities to be part of this orchestra of interventions. Those are the pillars that you, you're going to have to build a transition on. Um, it's a really great organizing concept, but you have to bring together and kind of operationalize this new development pathway. Um, and of course, movement building um, and political change. Procedural justice depends on it and people must be empowered to participate in these futures. Um, and in South Africa, I mean, despite all of this work on just transition and this, this kind of momentum and this impetus, um, we've seen there, as in many other countries, that vested interests start to adopt the language of just transition and use it as a, as a risk. They say, this is a barrier to action. We shouldn't have climate action because of the, the just transition implications. Um, and in South Africa, we still have many new coal mines being planned and undeveloped. There are new coal plants under development. In other countries in Africa, there's an enormous amount of political momentum around not coal, but new gas and new oil. So all of the work at this conference, I think, will have um, will be really exciting this week. You know, there's this work on stranded assets and, of course, the legal, feminist and community strategies of resistance to to fight that that remaining carbon lock in. Um, and as Christoph said, to to make sure that they aren't regressive and um, higher levels of unsustainable extraction than are needed, even under climate policy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse, for giving us a, a preview of some coming attractions at the conference to talk about just transitions and to invoke this notion of resistance and uh, procedural justice. Because with that in mind, a great honor and privilege to introduce Namante Nequimo. Um, she is the co-founder of Amazon Frontlines, and she's an indigenous Warani leader who's inspired her people uh, to legal victories in Ecuador. I don't know if you've read about them. They're quite stunning. Um, a great example of free prior and informed and consent in action um, to protect their ancestral territory. Uh, half a million acres of primary rainforest in the Amazon. It's worth also noting that she was elected the first female president of the Warani organization of Pastaza province. And um, just check out her bio, Time 100 Most Influential People of the Year, BBC Most Influential Women, not, we should make that distinction. Um, just really uh, impressive and an honor to have you here, Namante. Um, I'll also mention that along with Namante is her colleague Alex, who is going to do translation. So. Um, Go ahead, Namante, and uh, those of you who speak Spanish, you don't need it. Nani emen cabo, eat that egg, eat pen, nani emen cabo, eat that egg, eat pen, eat that egg, eat pen, mem, eng, my, my, eat that egg, eat pen, mem, eng, I'm by, eh, 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 Mi nombre es Nemonte Nenquimo. Al respeto, eh, antes de presentar, mi cultura es cantar. Esta música yo traigo eh, guacamayo rojo, 
es colectivo, vuela en la Amazonía, y ellos llevan mensaje a la vida. Y eso yo vengo desde la Amazonía, una mujer de la Amazonía que traigo la vida para difundir con ustedes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nemonte Nenkimo. I'm a Waurani woman. In my culture, before we speak in this kind of setting, we always start with a song. And this song uh, is about how the red macaw in the Amazon rainforest um, never flies alone. It always flies together. And flying together allows it to fly further um, and to navigate better. And so like a macaw, I have come from very far away. I have flown here to bring my message to you all about my land and my people. Antes de hablar sobre las leyes y comunicaciones, primero quiero contestar la historia del pueblo Orán. Before I share about um, my people's legal struggle and, uh, and our communications campaigning, I want to tell you about my people. Mi gente Waurani vivía en la selva por miles años, mucho, mucho años, sin conocer petróleo, sin conocer nada de, de la vida del mundo occidental. Ellos vivían en la selva, conexión con la naturaleza, en armonía. For thousands of years, my people lived in the Amazon rainforest without fossil fuels, without oil. Uh, we maintained a deep and harmonious connection with the natural world. Y los evangélicos entraron en el año 50 en territorio Waurani a conquistar nuestro alma, a conquistar nuestro petróleo que vive debajo de nuestra tierra. In the 1950s, evangelical missionaries arrived in our territory, and they came with the goal of conquering our people, conquering our souls, and extracting our resources. Y los evangélicos trajeron a una sola comunidad a los pueblos guauranis y los guauranis mis abuelos mi mi familiar murieron uno de los diarios 100 100 100 100 personas al día por el enfermedad polio primer contacto and they brought with them diseases like polio and in the height of the impact of those diseases on my people um, my grandparents would talk about how 100 people would die every day Y yo crecí en medio de esa conquista. I was born in the middle of this conquest. Y yo aprendí mucho de mis abuelos. Yo aprendí mucho llanto de mis, de mis abuelos y, y, y crecí esa forma de viendo que los abuelos contaban que antes de contacto al mundo vivían en armonía, vivían feliz, no había enfermedad, no había otro temor, vivían libre comían, pescaban, recolectaban fruta y vivían bien saludable. And I learned a lot from my grandparents growing up from their stories about times before contact with the outside world, how they lived, uh, how our people lived in harmony with nature, how we lived happy, how we didn't suffer from major diseases, um, and how we had enough food to eat and clean water to drink. Y cuando yo crecí, cuando yo soy joven, me fui a, a conocer a otro pueblo Que los petróleo estaba primer contacto. As a young woman, I had the opportunity to travel into other indigenous territories where I saw the impacts of oil over decades. Y cuando me voy donde otros pueblos veo que el petróleo es desarrollo para el ciudades grande, los pueblos compañeros estaban eh, toda la comunidad forestrado su su territorio. No había animales, no había agua limpio. Hasta la cultura de idioma de ellos estaba perdido, desconectado. And I saw the impacts of oil in other territories and how when the government was talking about development for indigenous peoples, the extraction of oil did not mean development. It led to deforestation, to the loss of animals, and to the lack of clean water. Y a las mujeres vi testimonio que ellos no pueden tener salud buena, tenían cáncer, y tenían los niños deformados, Y muerto también. I spoke with women who told me about the sicknesses and the cancer that they were experiencing. I saw children born with uh, deformed um, children. Y ahí em empecé a nacer coraje, llanto de mis hermanas, llanto de los otros pueblos. Empecé a encabezar, liderar como mujer joven. I became very angry hearing these stories from women, seeing the children, and I decided to become a leader and to work together with my people. 
porque la gente de afuera ven en la selva verde, baldío, los indígenas no utilizan, son ignorantes, dice, los mujeres indígenas somos sabios que rep representamos y tenemos mucho amor por miles años en la selva. And while governments and extractive companies look at our territory from afar and they just see uh, an empty land full of resources to extract, for my people this is not the case. For us we see a territory that is full of life and we have a deep love for our territory. Por eso mismo yo empecé a dibujar para el mundo que conozca, porque el mundo y el gobierno ve en la selva es petróleo, minería y maderera. And so our people, we began to create our own map so that we could show the governments and the outside world what our territory really means to us. Pero para nosotros como mujer indígena, para los pueblos indígenas, la selva es lleno de vida, es farmacia, es un lugar donde nosotros podemos vivir, es un lugar donde los ancestros están debajo de nosotros. Hay un lugar donde hay sagrado, hay un lugar que nos hace conectar, hay un lugar que nos hace respetar. To show the world that for us our land is everything. It's our pharmacy. It's where our ancestors are buried. It's a land full of sacred places. Y de ahí un momento estado ecuatoriano en el año 2012 entró en mi, en mi territorio donde yo vivo, donde yo nací, donde yo crecí. And it was at the time that we were building this map that the government came into my people's territory, into the land where I was born and where I grew up. Entra el gobierno estado ecuatoriano en un avión sin, sin comunicar. Nosotros los pueblos indígenas no pasamos como en la ciudad, en la casa. Nosotros tenemos mucho que hacer. Estamos en la selva caminando, pescando, yendo a ver las plantas, yendo a ver nuestras frutas para traer el consumo. Nadie estaba. El avión entró en el territorio. Lo que estaba en la comunidad poca dijo que, ¿ustedes qué necesitan? Hizo pregunta eso. The government, the uh, representatives from the Ecuadorian government arrived in my community in a small plane. And when they arrived, there was very few people in the community because we're busy people. We, uh, we, <laughs> we spend our time hunting, fishing, tending to our crops in our, in our gardens. And so the government arrived and asked the very few people that were present, what do you need? Y luego le entregaba cola y luego le hizo firmar, luego le hizo tomar foto y regresaron en una hora en avión saliendo a la afuera. They, they heard from the people about what they needed. They gave them Coca-Cola. They asked them to sign their names on a list and within one hour they took off in their plane. Y de repente escuchamos en 2018 el gobierno estaba pronunciando hay bloque 22 que está en una oferta para vender en los países grandes. Y nosotros dijimos, ¿dónde es bloque 22? Desconocíamos. And in 2018, we heard that the government um, was auctioning our lands and what they were calling Oil Block 22, auctioning our lands off to the highest bidder from around the world. Y nosotros dijimos, ¿dónde es? Y luego vimos en nuestro mapa era donde justamente estaba construido mi casa, los otros vecinos, todo alrededor de 16 comunidades dentro de la, esta comunidad. Um, and so our people asked, well, what is Oil Block 22? We've never heard of this. Let's see what this is all about. And we looked at where Oil Block 22 encompassed, and we saw that it was my community. It was neighboring communities. It was a total of 16 communities in Pastaza province. Y luego nosotros ya estábamos hecho, dibujado nuestro mapa con los abuelas, con los niños. Empezamos a reunir inmediatamente. And because we had been working together to build this territorial map, we were already, uh, we were unified. And so we came together to discuss this problem. Más que todos en encabezamos, levantamos las mujeres, todos los niños, y decidimos nuestra casa, nuestro territorio, es nuestra decisión. And so with the leadership, particularly of our women, we decided to stand up and fight. And we made the decision collectively that our territory is our home and it is not for sale. Para mí esa lucha era unión, respeto, amor y sabiduría. For me this fight was about unity, it was about love and it was about respect. Los derechos no pueden salvar. Rights alone will not save us. Nuestra sabiduría y nuestro respeto, nuestro valor, unión es la victoria. Our wisdom, our connection, our unity and our love and respect for each other, this is what gives us strength.
esa victoria también, no solamente para pueblos indígenas bauranes, sino quedó precedente para otra nacionalidad en el Ecuador. We took the government to court and we won. And our victory uh, is not just about our people alone. It's not just a benefit for my community, but it sets a legal precedent that can be used by other indigenous peoples. En el derecho corte dice que hay derecho. Entonces nosotros tenemos derecho como pueblos indígenas a decidir lo que pasa en, nuestros, en nuestra selva. Our case builds off of an existing right at the international level and establishes in my country the right for indigenous peoples to decide what happens on our lands. Y también aprovechamos de difundir en comunicación para que nos respalde nuestra lucha, porque era también importante. Sabemos que el gobierno y el petróleo es muy grande y es muy poderoso, nos puede vender con el, con el dinero a los jueces. A big part of our, of our fight too was um, building solidarity with people around the world, using communications channels to connect with people because the forces we are up against, the government is big and we are small, but through connection with people around the world, we can be stronger. Pero lo que yo puedo decir como mujer guaurani siento muy orgullosa porque estuvimos firmes, estuvimos firmes decidiendo con nuestro derecho para la vida de nuestros hijos y también para el futuro. As a Waurani woman, I am proud of what we achieved because we stayed firm and we stayed strong in our unity. And what we are fighting for is not just ourselves, it's for future generations. En esa lucha yo me reflexioné muy profundo. Eh, yo no me he ido a universidad. A mí me ha guiado los ancestros. La selva me ha hecho entender el respeto y el valorar nuestro conocimiento. I can stand here and tell you, I never went to university. But my strength and my vision comes from my ancestors, and it comes from the respect that they have taught me. Y, y el coraje y la unión. And there, it is them that gives me my strength and helped uh, our unity. Y yo he venido a dar mensaje aquí. Muchas de las veces eh, no hemos tenido ese espacio, las mujeres indígenas especialmente, para poder concluir, para poder dar ideas, porque muchas de las veces en el mundo ya están dando cuenta, el cambio climático está aumentando. And I've come here to give a message, because often indigenous women, we are excluded from these kinds of spaces, these um, spaces for policy and decision making. Las mujeres indígenas tenemos resu resultado y solución. No somos como mujeres eh, académicas, siempre queremos como... Eh, resultado adecuado. Yet we are the ones on the front lines, and it is through our struggle that we are having real impact against climate change. Espero que esa lucha ustedes difundan y unan para poder construir mejor mundo para la futura generación. Y muchísimas gracias. And I hope that you have heard my message today and that you will <laughs> well, <laughs> and that you will include us in your work, that you will include our perspectives and our voices, and that you will share our message. Thank you very much. Thank you. I almost feel like you didn't even need to translate that. That last part. <laughs> but you did, and thank you for doing that so well. Thank you, Namante, for making the long voyage to share with us. Um, wow, okay. So we've heard um, how um, from the front lines of what fossil fuel production means in communities and how these issues can be resolved um, both at the local level all the way to the global dimension in terms of markets and prices and actions to balance the need to um, phase down fossil fuels to ramp up um, 
clean energy and the urgency of that and getting that in the right rhythm and all the elements we need to bring to doing just transitions well. So with that, now it's time to open it up to the audience and allow you to ask a few questions of our panelists. So please introduce yourself, your, your name, affiliation, and who you are directing the question to. So we have a um, microphone, and I see Roberto's hand popped right up there, right in the back. Thank you. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you can hear me. My name is Roberto Schaefer. Ooh. I'm a professor from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and also a CLA, a CLA from Chapter 3, Long-Term Mitigation Pathways, from the recent IPCC report. And, and my question goes to Christoph. Christoph, uh, my question here is, why IEA has focused so much on 2050? Because as we have learned from the recent IPCC report, what really is necessary is not to be net zero by 2050, but we need to be net zero CO2 by the time the cumulative emissions have reached a level that temperature rise has reached 1.5 degrees. So my question is, because what's really important here is the trajectory, not the time of net zero, because this can somehow can send a wrong message that you don't need to do anything provided that you reach net zero CO2 by 2050. And finally, uh, why CO2 only? Because climate change is not only about CO2, and why energy only? For many developing countries, energy is not the issue, but deforestation, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the points that I'd like to comment. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for the, for the question. I will answer the, first, the last point you, you um, mentioned first, which is why energy? And that's because we are the International Energy Agency. <laughs> and that's where our expertise is. Um, so I, I, we do take into account, of course, emissions from other sources, from land use change, from um, agriculture. Um, but we really want our, our focus to be on the energy sector. And there's another very good reason for that, which is that we do hear a number of groups talking about offsetting emissions from the energy sector from action outside of the energy sector. And what we wanted to do was to show that the energy sector itself can be net zero emissions. It is possible for it itself to be net zero. It doesn't need to rely on offsets from, from elsewhere. In terms of why we talk about 2050, we anchor things on 2050 because if we have a large reduction in emissions to 2030 and then you continue that trajectory onwards, that is in line with the latest science on CO2 budgets, on carbon budgets. So roughly speaking from 2020 to 2050 in our net zero scenario, that is um, cumulative emissions of around about 500 billion tons in line with a 50-50 chance of 1.5 degrees. But as I mentioned, this is not just about delaying everything to, to the last moment. We do have very rapid action over the next 10 years. We need to see that, not just in terms of the deployment of technologies we know about, in terms of electric cars, in terms of efficiency, but also in terms of those new technologies that aren't yet at a very mature stage, whether that's things like hydrogen, um, whether it is things like decarbonizing some of high temperature uses in industry. We need to see action there over these next 10 years so that by the time we get to 2030, we're able for things um, to, to ramp up at scale. And finally, on why CO2 emissions, we focus on CO2 emissions because that's how the carbon budget is framed. However, we do model all other energy related greenhouse gas emissions. And in particular, we assume a very rapid reduction in methane emissions coming from fossil fuel operations. There's around about 120 million tons of methane coming from oil, gas, and coal operations today. And we have that dropping by three quarters within the next eight years. So by 2030, those emissions are at very, very low le levels. And that's very, very important because that methane change just by itself reduces the temperature rise. Oh, sorry, it avoids around about 0.1 degree of temperature increase. So it's not just about CO2 emissions. We do absolutely take into account methane emissions as well. All right, thanks. Let, let me see a showing of hands, and I'll try to get an idea of roughly, and I'm going to try to mix it up by age, gender, and all of that good stuff. Um, 
So some people I happen to recognize, and I'm not picking on you because <laughs> I know your names, but because I did see your hands go up early. So Natalie? With Rhonda. <laughs> Hopefully I'm the only Natalie in the room with a hand up. <laughs> Might be more than one. Um, hi, I have a question for Christoph. Um, also, I'm Natalie Jones. I work for IASD. Um, I have a question for Christoph. Um, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. I actually had a question um, about the Africa, um, about the Africa Energy Outlook that came out earlier this year. Um, and when I was reading it, I seemed to, um, I guess, I noticed um, a discrepancy with the. Um, um, apologies, it's taking words a while to come out today. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if they uh, um, actually play ball. Um, with the findings of the World Energy Outlook that no new production is needed, and then in the Africa Energy Outlook, it seemed like there was a bit more gas production in um, Africa. And I was wondering if you could explain this um, discrepancy. Thanks. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's let's take a few questions. Let's take let's take three questions. Um, all right. So I see um, masked gentleman there. Thank you, uh, Shin Asayama from National Institute of Environmental Studies, Japan. So I have a question, to Christopher Zell. So you said the high fossil price is not a substitute for climate policy. I uh, just want to ask you about your takes on ILA, like in Inflation Reduction Act in the US. Um, for me, it, it seems like ILA representing a new era of the climate policy. It's addressing like reducing the energy prices, but at the same time addressing the climate policy. So what do you think about the ILA? It's kind of like a, it's new. Like, what do you take on, on ILA? Thank you. And let's see some hands up again, but just for Jesse or Namonte. <laughs> All right, yes, good question. Hello, I am Andrea Cardoso from Universidad Magdalena. Eh, tengo una pregunta para Nemonte. Eh, Nemonte, el, uh, el bloque 22 está en el parque Yasuni, ¿verdad? Si nos puedes eh, contar más acerca de Yasuni. Y también quisiera que nos contaran más de la cosmogonía del pueblo indígena, de su relación con la naturaleza y cómo esa relación con la naturaleza y con la, con la selva madre influye en su lucha. So the question, as I understood, was if uh, Nemonte could elaborate on how Block 22 fits within the Yasuni um, context, and then also, I didn't understand Cuadra Juni. <laughs> yes, uh, I want her to tell us more about the cosmogony and the relationship to the to the nature and to the forest, because behind this uh, this um, fight is uh, their, 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 their beliefs and the importance of the forest for them. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Do you want to just start there, Namonte, and then we'll come back to Gustav. Uh, I'm just going to repeat the question one more yes. time, because yes. it's two parts. Absolutely. <clears throat> Bueno, esta pregunta es muy importante. Eh, en el Ecuador donde vivimos, Yasunín ya está operando el petróleo. Donde yo vivo, el Yasunín es por al norte del, de la Amazonía. Donde yo vivo es sur, porque Yasunín ya está extrayendo petrolera. Donde yo vivo, en bloque 22, no hay carretera, no hay explota, explotación petrolera. En vista de eso, aunque hay Hablan mucho para defender las leyes de Yasunín, pero los presidentes del ecuatoriano no respetan 
Y entonces, donde yo vivo, nosotros encabezamos muy fuerte contra él. Y otros pueblos indígenas tenían mucho miedo, decían, Nemo, tu pueblo, comunidad guaurani de bloque 22 pastaza, solo somos 22 comunidades, muy, muy pequeñas, la familia no es grande, la diversidad es 200 mil hectáreas. Y no importó eso, nosotros luchamos y ganamos contra el gobierno. ¿Por qué? Porque era lo que... ¿Por qué era importante? Porque teníamos conexión, nos dio miedo, aunque dicen que, aún, aún dicho, petroleros dicen que son como picaflor, tiene un pico largo en la flor, chupa el, el jugo de flor y no destruye. Así dicen supuestamente los petroleros, pero en realidad nunca va a ser como culibrí chupar solo su jugo. Le va a despatear todo y está hasta ahora... Ecuador ha habido miles, miles de rames, pero no ha sido remediado por petróleo ni, ni el gobierno mismo. No tienen la capacidad. En vista de eso, no queremos que repite esa historia. Hemos declarado que es donde yo vivo, Bloque 22, es como un, como un símbolo que no pueden, no pueden tocar ahora. Y eso estamos luchando hasta ahora. No hemos caído, estamos ahí. So thank you very much for your question. So to answer the first part of your question, um, uh, the oil block 22 <clears throat> actually is not within Yasuni National Park. It's to the south. In Yasuni National Park, they're already extracting oil from uh, several oil blocks. Um, we see what is happening in Yasuni, and that is all the more reason why we have to defend our lands from oil extraction. Um, in Yasuni, uh, and that's why we've taken a firm stance, no roads and no extraction in our territories. Um, in Yasuni, we see the hypocrisy of the government, and we see the fragility of the national park system and this protection at the, from the government level. We see how um, that hypocrisy and how oil can still be extracted from these places that are supposed to be protected, which is why we are going up against the government. We are a small nation. A lot of people told us, you're so few people, you'll never be able to go up against this big government with, some, with, with all of its resources. But through our connection with each other and our territory, we stood firm without fear, um, and we were able to win. The government talks about uh, it's the technologies that it can use to extract oil in a way that won't hurt the environment. Uh, they, they present it like how a hummingbird flies and takes nectar out of the flower without touching the flower and harming the flower. <laughs> But we know that this is impossible because we've seen the devastation from oil over the last five decades. We've seen thousands of oil spills across the Amazon and how the government fails and the oil companies fail to do any remediation. We don't want this situation to repeat. That's why we are firm in our stance. So for us, Oil Block 22 in our territory has become a symbol of the fight against extraction. All right, thanks. Um, Christoph. Thank you. I, I will be brief so we can get through some other questions. On, on the Africa Energy Outlook, the, the main scenario within the Africa Energy Outlook was what we call the Sustainable Africa scenario, which was slightly different from the net zero emissions scenario. So some of the conclusions on fossil fuel developments were different because there were different scenarios. But just to say briefly on that, there is a very large amount of natural gas in Africa, which has been discovered but not yet developed. And we did look at what the impacts would be if all of that was to be developed. And one of the key numbers that came through from this was that today, Africa is responsible, the continent of Africa as a whole, is responsible for 3% of cumulative CO2 emissions since the Industrial Revolution. If all of that gas which has been discovered is developed, that would go from 3% to 3.5%. So a very, very, very small increase. It is also likely that some of that will be developed um, re regardless of whichever pathway we, um, we, we go on as a world. And in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act, it, it is a very positive step forward. I mean, it's, it's one of the things I mentioned, talking about the political economy of transitions, we have seen some positive moves, like the Inflation Reduction Act, like Repower EU, and this will help move the needle. Um, we are currently updating our scenarios and we will fully include that Inflation Reduction Act in our scenarios, and you will see a big impact on clean energy deployment and on fossil fuel use as, as a result. So it's a very positive step forward, and it's one of the, the key kind of bright spots that we've seen despite everything that's, that's been going on. Well, thanks. It, it's great to be able to end on a, on a few positive notes. Uh,
the victories in, 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 in Ecuador and what you've been able to do, the Just Transitions Partnership, which Jesse is involved in, which we'll have a chance to explore more dimensions of, as well as advances in clean energy that still fall way short of what we need to be seeing. I saw a ton of hands pop up. That's a fantastic sign for the conversations you're about to have at the coffee break. I know you wanted to ask your question, but we're out of time in this session. So I want to just thank everybody for your energy. There's going to be plenty of time for discussions, and let's give it up for this panel.